Okay. So here are the rails. <laughs> and here is our show. Completely off. Completely gone today. What in the world? Derailed. <laughs> Yay, you're here. Welcome to the CK and GK podcast. Let's get going. is i never know what the is gonna be it still made me laugh and my child is back here snickering <laughs> yeah so welcome to ck and gk we are super glad you're here tomorrow is the first official day of summer mm-hmm. but i have been on break with my kids since the unofficial start which is memorial day so you need a break more than anybody Right. I'm loving the extra family time. I'm just, I'm loving summer break, but there's a lot of shuttling around uh, uh, for this play date or that event. Today, I spent more than five hours in the car. Yuck. So we're going to call Caitlin Picnic because I am clearly a basket case. (laughs) But Caitlin's not the only one here with me today. No, we have a couple of guests today. So with us today is Ben Chapman, an archivist with the Johnson County Heritage Center and Museum. And Ben has to have a Leslie Nope compliment. So Ben, I'm going to call you a stunningly helpful warrior for today's (laughs) episode. (laughs) And I also have with us our beloved Ariel Anderson, who also needs her own compliment. So she is a powerful, beautiful sun goddess. I feel like that was a a yoga teacher. And of course, Jenny, my gorgeous, rule-breaking dancer. I just (laughs) am so glad to have all of you here today. (laughs) Um, Today, we're going to be talking about a little bit of LGBTQIA plus history in honor of Pride Month. And um, I'm so excited to learn a little bit. And then we'll share some resources. And it'll be a great episode. All right. Should we catch up? Let's do it. Oh. Oh, we before we do that, we we have a correction to make. Yeah, we do. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, so last week, Jason, the Jason person you're talking about, it's Jason Biggs. Ah, of American Pie and yes. yeah, I I was like, So did you remember or did someone let you know? No, I we were working on the notes for this show. And I was like, corrections corner, do we have any? Co- oh my God, it's Jason Biggs. And I said it out loud. Like there, his name is Jason Biggs. So if you look I, to the last episode where we really couldn't figure out this man's name. <laughs> I have to say though, like I'm really proud of myself to get the Jason. Yeah, because I think we, celebrity yeah. names is definitely not in my wheelhouse. Oh, it's in mine. I can do it. And I can, I can be listening to a Southwest commercial and go, that's Ann Perkins. I know that that's Rashida Jones doing the voiceover for Southwest. She does. Also, John Krasinski used to do progressive commercials. But, uh, I don't know, maybe not progressive. It doesn't matter. It was an insurance company. It doesn't matter. That's the thing that I can do. And I couldn't remember this man's name. And so it's Jason Biggs. And that's our correction. (laughs) Jason Biggs. All right. Now I'm going to tell you what I'm obsessed with. Do it. It's still the fish tank. Of course. (laughs) Okay. So we got some new fish. We got a couple of clowns. We got a blue tang, which is a dory fish. We got a goby that kind of lives in the sand and digs around. We got a ton of fish. Like one of them, the sail fin tang, grows to be 10 to 16 inches. Yikes. It's a good thing that tank is like the size of a person. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. But we had an issue. Shrimp gate 2023. (laughs) Okay. So... We bought three shrimp, a coral banded shrimp, a skunk shrimp, and a pistol shrimp. I have not had dinner yet, and I am hungry. <laughs> so I'm just going to say these are not shrimp for eating. But no. I, I'm, no. I'm wanting to They eat. would not be good eating anyway. They're very small. Um, like sea so monkeys? Bigger than that. Bigger than that. <laughs> they're they're okay. about the size of uh, maybe two knuckles on your finger. She looks at her finger and tries to figure it out. Okay. Okay. I'm good. So 
the pistol shrimp is friends with the goby. His job is to dig up the sand and then the goby kind of filters it and makes his little house. We named him Pistol Pete because if you have a pistol shrimp, of course you have to name him Pistol Pete. And he disappeared. Uh oh. And then my husband calls me. This is only day two of fish. Okay. I pulled a body out of the tank. <laughs> it was a shrimp. Can oh, you call no. the fish store and talk to them about this? And of course, yes, I will call the fish store. No problem. But they were closed. This is important that they oh. were closed. Okay. I come home. He shows me the body. He digs it out of the trash. He shows me the little head. And I said, yeah, that's a shrimp. That's a shrimp. We have a murderer in our midst. And I am currently reading And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie. So, of course, <laughs> like, I'm dying that we have this, like, death one at a time in our tank. Um, it's like Clue. So, it's like Clue, right? Well. And she's like, I Agatha have to Christie you, and I go Clue. Like, oh, this, right. is, this is the difference between you and I. <laughs> Who reads? Well, she does. Uh, All right. Uh, because I'm on summer break, honey. Because I'm on summer break. Right. Okay, fair. And I'm spending a lot of time in the car. So if I'm not driving and I'm just waiting for someone to come out of something or, you know, waiting for something to finish, I can sit yeah, in the car and read. That's true. Um, so Pistol Pete is sleeping with the fishes. Uh, wow. That's all I get. It's just a wow. It was pretty good. I mean, we did a whole <laughs> bunch of egg pun jokes. <laughs> okay. So. So. So the fish right. door is closed. Pistol Pete is dead and we have his body. Okay. So the next day we're digging around and guess who we see? Pistol, Pistol Pete. Pete. Oh no. So now we have this rogue shrimp body because the coral bandit and the skunk shrimp are both visible. So who is either regurgitating shrimp bodies or brought one into our tank? I don't know, but here's the thing. It only took a quick Google to find out shrimp molt. Ew. Oh, Thank no. God the fish store was closed and I didn't call like an idiot and be like, hey, you guys fed, uh, sold us something that ate something else. Oh, no. Gross. So, so we just found F Pistol Pete's exoskeleton. He's doing just fine. Oh. I'm also, when we say we're reading, I am reading Lost Moon, which is um, Jim Lovell's book about Apollo 13. And it's what the movie was based upon. Mm. And it is amazing. I'm of totally obsessed with it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I did not know shrimp molt. I learned something new every time I talk to you about this fish <laughs> thing. Still laughing at baby Jessica. Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, For the benefit of Ben, baby Jessica is an anemone that we had to rescue from the bottom of the tank. Oh, rescue? Her rock was at the bottom, and we didn't know it when we put the rock in, so we had to move her rock and bring her up. So it was like baby Jessica got stuck down the well. We had to pull wow. her. Wow. Wow. See, my uh, fish tank, when I ha had one growing up, did not have nearly the lore that it sounds yours <laughs> does. Um, this is th it, truly entertaining. Um, please, tell me more. I mean, this woman is drama here, there, everywhere. Like, you, she will, she can make a story out of anything, and this fish tank is legit a soap opera right now. Like, I can't. It sounds like it. It is my, it is Vanderpump Rules. It is my scandal, but it's a fish tank instead. So Roscoe so was wearing a piece of algae on his head <laughs> and the sailfin was trying to eat it, but kept getting stung by Ro Roscoe is um, a sea urchin. So and urchins normally wear things on their head. So he's wearing a piece of algae and the, the sailfin is trying to eat the algae, but keeps getting stung. So he would like bite it and then back off and then bite it and then back off. I'm like, there's plenty of algae in this tank. Go eat somewhere else. This is a mess. <laughs> this is like Finding Nemo. They're like all these little personalities. And oh my gosh. Tank. It's totally like fi Finding Nemo. Oh, the oh the coral banded shrimp is the same one that's in fi Finding Nemo. Oh, really? The one that lives in the tank in the dentist's office. Yeah. We. Oui. Yeah, the one that's that one. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, one. I remember. One. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, love it. We, oui, we. Oui. Love, love it. Oh, goodness. Okay, well. Uh, 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 <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Sorry. Can't hear you, Peach. Um, all right, so <laughs> learning learning new things is a is a theme right now. So I'm gonna say my current one. Um, we've talked about my ADHD tendencies before. Ariella is probably one of the people who talks me off of my ADHD ledge more than most people. Um, we talked about this the other day. I, 
I got on a puzzle kick and I shared the puzzle kick on the show and I really needed a table to hold my puzzles. <laughs> and Ariella is the one who was like, stop it right now. You do not need a $300 puzzle table for a puzzle you probably won't finish because your fixation is going to take you to something else. And so she's let like, me tell you this. I- Ariella yeah. is not the only person who thinks you should not have a table. During a listen back, my daughter, who's 11, was like, she shouldn't get a puzzle table. My mother-in-law said this. <laughs> my mother-in-law was like, okay, but really, where are you going to put it? And Ariella has also been to my house and she's like, okay, but really, where are you going to put it? And I was like, I don't know. It's not the point. That's what Abby said. She's like, is she going to get rid of a table to put in a puzzle table? I'm going to make a whole new coffee table and it's going to be just for my puzzle. <laughs> no. Um, okay, so I have a, a healthier hyperfixation right now <laughs> than my puzzle. And no, my my puzzle is still not done from last fall. So um, I am learning all of these new like software programs for my job. And it's actually really healthy to be focusing on these things because I have a client who is keeping me very busy. So like I am learning um, how to put together web pages right now. Um, I am learning a whole bunch of things about our customer service uh, management software. Like I am just, and and I'll get in on a kick and I'm like, I have to figure this out. And it, <laughs> it causes some problems where things don't get done. But I feel like I'm learning a lot in the process and it's been very healthy to to focus on those things instead of, you know, puzzle tables, organi- organizing the pantry and making my husband crazy because he always or- he's like, Oh, you're going to organize? Okay, great. That day that I was late to work because I was or- uh, organizing the condiments on my fridge door. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Stuff like that. Um, do our helpful warrior or sun goddess have any things <laughs> that they're, they're obsessed, obsessed with? with? Do you want to go first? I, I would like Ben to go because I told Caitlin that I was very excited to hear what Ben's <laughs> obsessions oh, and gems were. You did so I, I, would, oh, okay, okay, okay. I would like Ben oh, to go man. first. Oh, okay. Well, one of them, I, I gotta say, it's a show, actually, that I've been obsessed with. It's called The Other Two, and I'm not sure mm. if anyone here has heard of it. Mm-hmm. No. Uh, it's a comedy. Essentially, the premise is uh, two millennials living in New York City uh, have to grapple with the fact that their 13-year-old brother becomes an overnight star, uh, akin to Justin Bieber, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's who they're modeling off of. The comedy is great because uh, his... The older brother, the millennial who lives in New York, is gay. And um, it starts out, I think, second episode. And I'm sorry if this is a spoiler, but it's just too good. Um, with this pop song where he's saying, my brother's gay and that is okay. <laughs> and the episode follows a day in his life of the song gets published. He hates it. He loves it. He hates it. And by the end, he's in a club where they've remixed it into a dance anthem. And And it's about him. (laughs) I love it so much. This show is um, so timely with its comedy and uh, really written from a a very informed perspective uh, from the gay scene in New York. Because the jokes are just, the jokes hit really well. Where can we find it? Yeah, it It is on uh, oh, I was going to say HBO Max, but I believe it is just Max now. Yes. Oh, yeah. Max is the thing to watch. Isn't that Max. what they say? Mm-hmm. Max? Is that their, their tagline? I can't like remember that. what yeah. it is, but it's, it's something Not about a very good tagline watching. if we can't remember. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ariella, what are you obsessed with right now? I'm going to be honest. This is this is a geeky thing, but I think I've got the geeks on I on have the show said today. worms before. <laughs> That is fair. Uh, that is fair. That, that episode <laughs> was fascinating, though. That was a fascinating episode. So I, I'm obsessed with going to the library as a place to work because mm. I'm not responsible for anything at the library. Like, yeah. so, so I've been going on Sundays. Spoken on like s- a true adult. <laughs> yeah, a parent. It's a a very, very, right. sure. But right. just the idea of I am not responsible for it. It makes me think of that Kevin Spacey quote in what is that? American Beauty. I want the job with the least responsibility possible. <laughs> and they like put him on the yeah. drive through <laughs> at the fast food place. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. Yeah. 
I've been going on Sunday afternoons. Sorry, but it's it's not it's not our county library system because our county library system needs many many improvements. So I crossed oh. the county line into Wake into Wake County, and oh. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, shout out to the them. <laughs> so I cross I cross the county line. And from one to five, I find a corner and then I get work done on my book. There's no dishes to do. There's no pets bothering me. There's no kids banging on the door. That's a great thing because you're able to get so much done. I know you've told me a couple of times, like that's been really healthy. And like great way that you can support your library. Like I pay the $25 a year year membership to Mm -hmm. join a library system in which I do not live. So I could take out books, and I do take out books, but very often now when I go to the library, I am just, I'm using it for its Wi-Fi. Yeah. (laughs) That's great. And no shade to Wake County Libraries, because uh, I was born in Wake County. I love Wake County. Earlier this week, I participated in a virtual program they had called uh, Drag Herstory. (gasps) Yes, I did see that they had that. Yes. Yeah, they've got a whole series of virtual events this month. Yep. Johnson County Libraries does not have, unfortunately, a uh, virtual pride series. No. Y'all are like starting a library clash. Yeah, you are. Right? Like, I can already <laughs> you know? see the jets and the sharks in front of their libraries, like Wade County versus Johnson County. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, rural yeah. rural libraries. But you know what? If If we do start a feud between Wake County and Johnson County libraries, maybe that will force Wake County to invest more in their libraries and we'll get better libraries. Space race, you know, like a yeah. little healthy competition. Right. Yes. Little healthy competition. Yes. This is the this is the capitalism I would like to see. I would like to see competition among the two libraries so that they both get better. Battle of the books. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm here for it. All right. Do we have any gems, anything ridiculous that happened this week? Mine is both ridiculous and amazing. My four-year-old son is practicing inclusivity, and he doesn't even know what it is. He loves construction workers, right? Like, Mm. this is probably a typical four-year-old boy thing. And he wants to be a construction worker when he grows up. And we have a friend who is in construction, so, you know, we're trying to foster that. We know he's four and it will change 17 times between now and when he turns five. But we saw these construction workers and he screams, look, mom, destruction humans. Yay. (laughs) Destruction humans. I love that. Oh, that makes me so happy. (laughs) Yes. Here for it. This is like you always using the word grownups in emails instead of saying like, talk to your mom and dad. You're saying hi, grownups. And I got one of those emails from um, the director of Sam's camp last week. And I was like, he says grownups. And it just made me so happy. Like it's just anytime you can just use the broader word and he's four and he's using them human we're all oh, I just love it yeah. so much what is no so cool. um I hosted an event at the junior league which is an organization for people who identify as female yes it, it, I mean it is a women's group yes we were doing a makeup class for members and I assumed they're preteen daughters sure. but instead of calling it mommy and me I called it member and miss and that allowed it doesn't matter what your relationship is to the teenage yeah. girl I love that. And all you have to do is change language. Didn't cost me anything. Yeah. Mistruction humans. Mistruction humans is perfect. Um, my kid is not that cute right now. <laughs> okay, that's my gem for next week. Okay. Well, let me tell you what happened today. We took him to get a haircut. My child has a very intense cow lick. His dad has it too. My child is Macaulay Culkin's mini me. Okay. Like this is like. It, oh, it's it, spot on. It, it's, it's spot, spot on. on. I used to get and we stopped don't just in the grocery say it. store. Yeah, right. no, no, it's real. Like we used to get stopped in the grocery store and the, the people working there would go, hey, did you know that your kid looks like the kid from Home Alone? And we'd go, oh, really? No. And we've never heard that before. And then we go to the next aisle. Yeah. <laughs> and it happened again. So it, it's a thing, right? Yeah. Anyway, we go to get a haircut today. My child has been in a phase where he needs to have a mohawk. Now, mohawks don't really work on people who have cowlicks. I'm just going to put that out there. 
Okay. So we've done the faux hawk thing because then I can spike it up in the right, right, in right. front and, and do, you know, and, and I'm fine. I don't, it's his hair. He has to be happy with it. So I don't care. But then today he was pointing at a kid and he's like, this is what I want my mohawk to look like. And it's like really short, but then like buzzed down the middle. It doesn't really work for a kid who has a cow. Like, like we, we could do it, but it really, it just wasn't Send them to happen. me <clears throat> with my thin, flat hair. I have had a whole life of hair disappointments. Well, my husband, who again has the exact same cowlick as our child, was like, sorry, pal. I really wanted to have the split down the middle, the 1997 skater boy hair with the split oh, down yeah, the yeah, middle. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Be like, the butt hey, cut. Yeah. He really <laughs> wanted that. Guess who couldn't have it? This kid. He had the Randy Travis tail, rat tail in the back for forever. He was just like, you get no sympathy for me. Like, I'm not, I don't feel bad for you. Meanwhile, I'm like trying not to cry as my child is like desperately wanting to have this mohawk. And so finally, he just tells the lady to cut the hair all the way off right in the front, but leave the rest of it. So like, he just wants like a square where you cut off the mohawk. And the, she, the woman looks at me and she's like, no, no. Uh, he wants his cowlick gone. And I was like, well, we can buzz off all your hair. And then he goes, no, don't tease me. And I'm like, no, 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 we're not teasing. I'm telling you, this is the only solution to your problem. We can either buzz it all off or you can have the mohawk that you have right now. And he's like, but this isn't what I want. And I just, it was just kind of a hot mess of a thing. And it turned into a near meltdown in the chair and then finally turned into an actual meltdown in the, in the parking lot outside. And I, and I was just like, and now he's of course happy as a clam and all these things but like you have to have the meltdown in the middle of the parking lot after you hard to bounce back from that as the mom well and yeah i'm still mad (laughs) i'm still i'm still annoyed with it yeah so we'll see how tomorrow goes when i have to do his hair he's gonna want it slicked down in the front because that's what he wants for the mohawk right right, but guess whose hair doesn't get slicked down in the front the boy with the cowlick so it's just gonna be it's just gonna be a mess Anyway, what other gems we got from you two? Let's hear them. Today was kindergarten graduation um, for my for my Congrats. one and only. Yeah, exciting. yeah. So they did they did awards like you know like the the kindergarten awards and stuff, and but the first one that the teacher is like this student um, ha- gets an award for you know like good speller and. Um, I don't know, it's a good reader. Like, I don't remember. Um, and then it was like, and the healthy snack award. And I was like, huh. And then she said my child's name. And I was legitimately <laughs> like, what? <laughs> In teaching, we call that a reach. Um, <laughs> well, uh, like and like, yeah. And like for context, my child who like, like mom has ADHD and is um, is an extremely picky eater. Um, he has been diagnosed with something called ARFID, which is um, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, and it's very common mm. among children with um, who are neurodivergent kids who are autistic kids who have ADHD. Um, it's it's like take picky eating and make it so serious that you don't know if they're getting enough calories to survive kind of thing. So my kid, our priority is just calories. So like the day that I came downstairs, I, you know, woke up, came downstairs and he was sitting on the couch with the container of potato chips watching cartoons. Like in my house, that's okay because he needs calories. And so when he goes to school, because he said, and, and parents whose kids are neurodivergent could probably know what I'm talking about when I say that every single day he basically goes to school with the same thing. He goes to school with like a Cliff Kids chocolate mm-hmm. chip bar, yeah. bar a, yeah. yeah, yeah, a quarter of a, of a chocolate, double chocolate muffin, some kind of mm. like crunchy thing that I know he'll eat. He'll get like a little bag of gummy bears every day. I'm like, is it because I send fresh fruit every day? Like every day because he loves fruit. Like he loves fruit. And so like as someone and Caitlin's known, known me for, for long enough that she knows that we've been struggling so, so much with my kid and food that like 
for him to get an award for eating is... <laughs> you frame that puppy. It, you frame it. Right. I'm, I'm like, yeah, like it feels really validating, but it's also kind of like, what? I'll take it. All right, Ben, give us your gem. The most wonderful thing that I did recently was uh, I saw a performance of the play Corpus Christi. It is a passion play about a uh, retelling of the life of Jesus Christ as told by gay men living in Corpus Christi, Texas in the <laughs> 1980s. So it oh is my goodness. a I very interesting, right now. <laughs> very interesting performance. And I happened to know somebody who was in it uh, and they were Joshua or Jesus. It was uh, phenomenal. And by sheer coincidence during intermission, I met uh, one of the key organizers of Pride of Cary, which is a local new nonprofit. And uh, during that 10 minute intermission, he was kind of able to give me some advice, uh, kind of a heart to heart, felt like a real uh, mentor moment. It was really nice. That's cool. I'm just dying at the men in the 80s in Corpus, Texas. Oh this my is gosh. So, the premise is killing me. This is hilarious. That's so funny. Um, I went with my boyfriend and he, I mentioned to him what the play was about, but uh, he kind of turns to me when the apostles are introducing themselves and he was like, I don't know what's going on. He didn't know the apostles' names. <laughs> so, but there once they go. got to Jesus, or no, once they got to Judas. Oh, everyone knows uh, Judas. Yeah, everyone knows Judas. He, he caught on Thanks then. to Lady Gaga. Absolutely. <laughs> Stop. I was raised Catholic. That's a different, that's a different. Come on. We both taught at a school that said Baptist on the side. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I was raised Catholic too. I'm like, oh, my cheeks are burning because I'm trying to keep it together. Oh, goodness. Um, All right. That sounds like a good time to take a break. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, We're back. Welcome back. Yay. All right. So, Ariella, um, tell us how you and Ben happen to be part of this episode today so you and i we were talking about pride episodes and we were bouncing ideas kind of back and forth and stuff and i suggested doing a show on pride history and i know a guy that's when i connected you with ben um yeah so and as i do for lots of people as i seem to introduce friends i brought you a guest i love it (laughs) So um, I'm really glad that you did. Ben has already fascinated me with so many stories. Um, So Ben, you're going to give us a few historical facts about pride and origins of pride. Yes, absolutely. I think a lot of people like to start at Stonewall. um, And the Stonewall Inn is definitely a major part of the story. But it's not really the beginning. Um, Mm -hmm. um, But at least in the United States, um, I think for the history of pride, it's useful to start in post-World War II, um, California and New York and Washington, D.C. Broadly, this is sometimes described as the homophile move. So one of the first individuals to actually picket for employment protections was Frank Kamney. He spent a lot of his life as an activist advocating for non-discrimination protections in employment. So... At that first protest, I believe there were about a dozen gay and lesbian individuals. I don't believe they invited any transgender individuals. And the reason may become clear after this. uh, He insisted that the men wear suits and the women wear dresses and heels. Hmm. So in this homophile movement, a lot of the individuals that were active and that were uh, sought as and seen as leaders they wanted to present themselves in a heteronormative way and appeal to respectability and conventions of the society at the time, rather than really challenging any of the social order, as it were. That's interesting. So is this kind of like, there's really no reason to be afraid because we're just like you sort of situation? Is that what you're thinking this was? Yeah, and um, you'd see it in their uh, picket lines and their protests. You'd see all of these very neatly dressed individuals holding matching sized signs in a line 
very orderly, not quite what you think of seeing LGBT people gather now. Really kind of Stonewall and the, the pride movement that emerges after that takes a lot of its inspiration from the successes of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. So that's where you see uh, people and activists who are uh, more willing to directly challenge the social order. Okay. This post-World War II, you don't really think about it going back that far, right? Especially because that's that's the 50s. Like we're not, the 50s are, this is the June Cleaver era. This is, this is not the 60s, right? (laughs) Post-World War II, in such a conservative time in so many ways. And when people are talking about the good old days, they're often talking about the 50s. and Lucy and Ricky in two twin beds. They're married and they had to be in two twin beds. This is a big deal to even be talking about it in this time period. So I don't even think I realized, I think I only associated it with the 60s and not this far back, honestly. Uh, Yeah. Um, Well, I think it's important to note, although there were these groups that you can, you can point to, they created records, they staged these protests. Um, It's fair to say that the nation as a whole was not broadly aware of their demands, of what they were doing. Um, These would have been locally reported stories. It's not until uh, the riot at Stonewall, LGBT identity really breaks onto the national stage. Um, Speaking of that, a lot of organizations of that time would use gay and lesbian as shorthand. The names that these different organizations use as well evolves over time. Interesting. I didn't realize that either. Oh, yeah. Really, to kind of even push it further back, you might have heard of um, Max Hirschfeld, Mm -mm. who was a uh, German sexologist. Yes, I have heard that name before. Yes. Yes. So um, he opened up the first institution uh, to scientifically study uh, sexuality and gender Mm -hmm. in uh, Germany in the 19... Actually, I believe it was 1919 that he opened it. So in the 20s, he's kind of pioneering this research in Europe, lesser known aspect of LGBT history, One of the reasons I'm familiar with it is one of the first actions of the German Nazi party, uh, a youth organization of the Nazi party, was to occupy the university building where the library was, and they had a book burning. And that is one of the famous photos that you see survives. Oh. Um, It was the books from the Hirschfeld Institute. Wow. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I know of that name is because of my study of that time period. But also, um, I was a psych major, as we all were, most popular majors, fun fact. Um, But that's why I know that. You mean wildlife and fishery science ain't that popular? (laughs) No, (laughs) not at Colorado. No, (laughs) it was all marketing and, and psychology. And the most common, actually, major minor, psychology and then marketing. Uh, anyway, but that's why I know that name because I studied him in two contexts. That's good to know. Okay, so that's before Stonewall. Do we have more before Stonewall? Oh, I do. I will say uh, when you asked me for my uh, hyperfixation earlier, I almost wanted to say pre Stonewall LGBT history. Oh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for the last few months, uh, I've been really interested in trying to learn as much as I can. So. To go back to an early figure in uh, American history, there is a figure in colonial history. So we're talking 1700s here. Oh my gosh, my eyebrows are going to touch the ceiling. They are raised so high. Mine won't because I, they're Botoxed, but the, I am the <laughs> Do it. This figure went by the title, the public universal friend. They identified themselves as genderless. Uh, A lot of non-binary people point to them as an early non-binary figure in American history. Oh, I've heard of this. No, I've heard, or I've heard of this person. I think it was Thurline did a whole episode on it and it was fascinating. And of course, I don't remember any of the details, but I'm feeling very excited that I recognize this. (laughs) Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's uh... good. They lived an interesting life. Um, they were raised qu- as a Quaker in the uh, that mm. community. And after suffering a fever in which uh, a lot of people in the community died, and they uh, were very seriously ill, um, after they recovered, um, that is when they introduced themselves or reintroduced themselves to their friends as uh, the public universal friend and embraced 
a non-binary identity. Interesting. And Quakers are the Society of Friends, is that right? Yes, that's right. I mean, I feel like Quakers just, if you're looking for like some good, like authentic living a, a, a welcoming life, I feel like these people have the best reputation in that regard of like, this is what we do because this, if you're going to make an argument for religion, this is probably the way to make that argument, right? Because they're the ones who who adopt that sort of mentality. Um, so I'm not at all surprised to hear that you say this person identified as non-binary and then they were a Quaker. That's why my eyebrows didn't move up that time. It's not because of the vote. <laughs> <laughs> oh. They don't move. They really, they really, really don't move. And I love it. So should I address the elephant in the room? That my eyebrows don't move? We've already talked no. about this. Oh. I don't know much about Stonewall. Ooh. So that was why I kind of didn't want to dwell too much on the much, much earlier history. Uh, the Stonewall Inn was a gay bar in New York. And in 1969, the police raided. It wasn't the first time that they'd raided that bar. Um, but the people um, that were there were fed up. So rather than allow themselves to get the arrested they resisted physically mm. by throwing objects at the, the arresting officers by pushing them back it turned into a larger riot on the streets of that neighborhood in new york this is not the first time that stonewall had been raided this kept happening over and over and over again am i right about that yes i will say um i'm not well versed in the historiography of stonewall okay. but i recently was exposed to the idea uh, that the owner of Stonewall had an agreement with the police. So when he got a certain amount of money, um, he would allow them to come in and oh. uh, arrest and raid. There's been conflicting accounts from the kind of veterans of Stonewall. I should mention two major figures are Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who are uh, two transgender women who lived in New York. And I believe Marsha was... Uh, present at Stonewall, but a lot of people say through the first brick, I've heard through the first shot glass. Um, it's one of those stories that it gets told so many times, and there is so much um, interest in it that it can almost be difficult to hear through the noise. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's a riot. Yeah. Hey, you know, anytime there's chaos, the accounts are going to all be a little bit different. So there, there is that piece of it. My understanding also is that payment that you were talking about also had maybe something to do with some um, underground, shall we say, businessmen ties. I don't want to say the mob. Ah, I, I sincerely apologize. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with the facts. I need to go back to the primary sources. No, no, no. I, I'm, I guess I have been known to be fact adjacent. So that's all I was going to say. Is, it's is kind just, of the theme of this show. Right. It's like sometimes I'm telling the <laughs> truth and I swear I know I, I know what I'm talking about most of the time. So, oh, well, that yeah. takes the pressure off me. Right. Me no, you're good. <laughs> from... You're good. You're an actual historian. So I'm just going to take what you say and, and go with, mm -hmm, that sounds about right. Well, the fact you're right. Um, it was a riot. It was chaotic. A lot of the first hand accounts and the facts of that event kind of weren't properly documented at the time. Uh, but there's also the trend of individuals who were not present, who later oh, wanted to own a piece of it. Oh, absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm an activist. I was there. So what was the aftermath? Yes. The aftermath from Stonewall, uh, really, it's when everybody was really pushed to begin considering the existence of gay and lesbian people. So prior to this, everyone's in the closet and there's not even really an opportunity for people to come out of the closet, as it were, because there is just this prevailing ignorance. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't disappear overnight. Um, and I would even say that it hasn't fully disappeared in all parts of the United States. But yeah, the real change that happens after Stonewall is this rejection of the homophile strategy. So after 1969, there was never again a national coalition of these different what we recognize today lgbt groups they couldn't coalesce into a political co coalition there's been some historians who've written about this and have said it's because stonewall was an event that allowed for a paradigm shift 
really after Stonewall, people that were involved in these homophile organizations, they didn't just disappear. And the, some of the organizations didn't disappear, but there was a shift. There, there's two scenes really that dominate um, LGBT history of the 70s, and it's New York, it's California. Some LGBT historians are trying to kind of start to document wider histories. Sure. But right now, um, that's what's kind of been the focus. So there isn't as much that has been written about kind of what is the impact of Stonewall in, you know. Kansas? Yeah, in Kansas, <laughs> um, which is a fascinating historical question for some young enterprising historian. Sure. Stonewall kind of begins to allow people to come out of the closet. And the parents in New York City are actually some of the early activists that are willing to go out on the streets, willing to put themselves out there and say, you know, my child is gay, my child is lesbian, my child is bisexual. Once people started to become aware of their brother, their cousin, their aunt, their uncle, of this phenomenon in New York City, broadly, there was growing tolerance. But I think it's useful in terms of kind of talking about the broader LGBT history um, to talk about it in cycles. Mm. So there are kind of periods where there's a waxing, where there's progress and there's advance. And then there's a waning occasionally where things will seem to regress and there's backlash. Stonewall begins this period of momentum and growth of communities. You start to see in the late 70s, conservatives begin to organize opposition. In California, this comes in the form of a few efforts. One of the major ones to talk about is uh, the Briggs Initiative. So there was a conservative state senator in California who said or thought these gay and lesbians who work as teachers are dangerous because they're going to turn our kids or try to recruit them. So he wanted to make it so that the state of California could not employ openly lesbian or gay teachers. Oh, wow. What people don't know about history. History is doomed to repeat itself. Mm -hmm. Talk about cycles. Mm -hmm. Um, Here we go. Absolutely. So one of the major figures to oppose that was a man by the name of Harvey Milk, Mm. the first open elected politician. And Mm -hmm. the reason we frame it that way and phrase it that way is uh, there have been gay politicians before. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And there are even some that have come out during their tenure in office. Mm -hmm. But they weren't elected. Precisely. So the movie Milk with Sean Penn, this is like a big figure. Tell us a little bit more about him if you can. Yeah. So he's actually this, this really interesting figure. He moves to the Castro. It's a neighborhood in San Francisco. Yes, it is. He um, kind of goes through these changes over the course of his life. So when he first moved and embraced California, it was, uh, he embraced this kind of countercultural look, aesthetic and lifestyle. And um, after a few years, he had cut his hair, put it on a little bit more of a professional performance, as it were. He had started to advocate for people in the Castro because they, there was a growing recognition that California and some of these port cities were seen as a refuge for gay teens all across the United States. Oh. Yes. San Francisco in particular in, in sure. California, New York City on the East Coast. And it's, it's a little bit of cliche at this point, but um, it, it really is for a time the destination for queer youth. That's not to say that some didn't stay, but by and large, if if you were looking to embrace your identity or even explore it, these cities would have began to have reputations. You know, a year after Stonewall, you, there's this broad awareness in the public consciousness. It kind of builds over time. Sure. There was a parade uh, one year after the anniversary of the Stonewall, and this is the Liberation of Christopher Street Parade. It's it's kind of a deliberate opportunity. These activists wanted to embrace celebration. There was, of course, a serious uh, reason for it. But rather than a picket, rather than a uh, very professional response, uh, they wanted to march down the street, commemorate the day where they stood up and said that they wouldn't be bullied anymore. 
it's it's something I, I kind of I love reading about because to imagine that time innovating it and, and, and trying things out for the first time. I, I can't imagine. Yeah, man, that's so interesting. Yeah, I think that's really, really, really special. And I, I love how much it's spread and how Pride has become just this big thing across the country. And it's um, fun party time. And, you know, there's all these like hilarious jokes and, and just silly things happening all around you. And then, of course, you have a few people who are like, you know, narrow minded bigots and whatever. But then everyone's like, do you need a hug? You must need a hug. You're so, oh, you just, you look like you're really sad. You clearly need a hug here. This is all about love. Come on over. <laughs> and I've just decided that I'm clearly too old to participate in Pride the way that I used to. But I'm going to go down and be one of the moms who gives out mom hugs because I just, I love it so much. It's so, so special to show up and like actually be a part of something that, that matters to you like that. And I can't even imagine the courage that it must have taken for that first parade to have happened, right? right? Can't even imagine what it would have been like for them to start to get this vision of, you know, we don't have to accept this, these conditions. Uh, I want to pivot a little bit from Pride history um, to you as a historian, Ben. Throughout your practice, how has the definition of history changed for you? Ooh, interesting question. Well, I'll, I'll start with my undergrad. Um, so like I said, I studied the history of science. My undergraduate career, uh, once I got this very excellent mentor, was pretty much just um, I wanted to take these classes and explore how humanity built our understanding of the natural world around us. Um, so I was a philosophy minor. I studied the history of philosophy, the philosophy of science, the history of the philosophy of science, et cetera. Oh my Combine gosh, those so meta. And, yeah, yeah, very, <laughs> very meta. And uh, oh, it's a great I, word to describe this. Oh absolutely. man. Absolutely. Maybe historian I am not. I prefer student of history still, but. The ones who think they know everything are the ones who get it wrong. So I like that. Yeah. And in sign language, when you sign for a career it's that thing person so you're a history person Ooh. oh i didn't know that that's yeah. interesting i that's have it. heard one of the terms i like is uh, memory professional <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, am I am not excluded. a memory professional yeah. <laughs> I have sticky notes that I've covered up on my desk and I like forgot what was on the sticky note. Um, earlier this year, Caitlin, I don't know if I told you this. I thought of something really important and it was so important that I took a sticky note off right then so that I could write it down and put it on my calendar. The problem is I didn't write it down. You did tell me. <laughs> so I just had a blank sticky note. And like I was like, man, whatever that was, calendar, was a really yeah. big deal. And I think we've talked about this before. We're like, I have started doing something really random when I remember something. And I'll, so like, I have like a yoga mat next to me over here because my super professional office is, Never mind. For tax purposes, there is no yoga mat in here. Anyway, um, sometimes I will remember something and I'm like, oh, that's good. I should remember that joke for later. And then I'll like throw the non-yoga mat into the middle of the room. And then when I get up and turn around, I'm like, why is it in the middle of the room? Because there was a thing that I was going to remember. And right. then I, usually it comes right. back to me, but it doesn't always come back to me. So memory professionals, we are not. Uh, if you want to call yourself one, I'm I'm here for it. No, here. I uh, you should us. see how many post its I have on my desk. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I am, I like records management. Uh, that's actually for graduate school. I focused uh, as a library school student on archives and records management. So the idea that there's a system that can remember things for me is very comforting uh, because I will forget <laughs> like nobody's business. <laughs> yes. Um, in graduate school studying library science at UNC Chapel Hill and a significant event happened on campus. We had a uh, Confederate monument that was uh, torn down by act. Oh yeah. Silent Sam was the name of it. And uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Like in so, in so many ways, Chapel Hill is known for being very progressive, uh, especially like science, medicine, things like that. You, you hear about that. And then there's a Confederate monument in the middle of the campus. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Broadly, I'll, I'll just say, as a memory professional, as someone who's in this <laughs> field, it's pretty necessary for us as historians. 
uh, to be responsible with history of the Civil War, history of enslavement. You know, these statues are not books and they are not the history. They are monuments that were erected by people with goals. And if you look in the archives of UNC Chapel Hill, you can find a speech delivered uh, by one Julian Carr uh, at the dedication of Silent Sam. Um, And that speech referenced uh, the fight, not during the war, uh, but in the years after that uh, men of the white race were engaged in. And again, I'm, I'm not quoting precisely, but um, he was alluding to the fact the defense of the South um, that these men had had engaged in in the dedication of this speech in this of this monument. So you know, past is present, and um, we I mentioned these kind of cycles. I believe uh, there was a recent study that showed educators kind of most consistently fail to really teach is the Reconstruction era. And I'd have to say that's that's true um, as somebody who's worked as a memory f- professional in North Carolina. That era is uh, kind of the, the least well understood. I- I'm trying to think of like why that would be. Uh, one, it's, it's not really understood what, by the teachers themselves. That's one thing. But also um, it is a controversial time period. And so people tell teachers to stay away from it. But also sometimes you just don't get to it in your curriculum. <laughs> I'm just thinking yeah. about like in Texas. It's a break point. Right. It's a it's a good stopping point um, for Civil like, War. For, yeah. It's yeah. like once you get to that point, oh. then you kind of wrap. Like if you if you go, you know, a mile wide, an inch deep, you can get through a lot of U.S. history in one year. But if you spend any time kind of diving deeper, you really can't. And I mean, I'm thinking about my own instruction when I was teaching Texas history and how the reason that we talked about Juneteenth is because we talked about Black History Month, which it did it didn't fit in what I was teaching at the time, but because I talked about Black History Month and how that that impacted Texas history and then ultimately the creation of the Juneteenth holiday, it's the only reason that it came up, right? Even though the reason that we have Juneteenth is because of Texas not telling it's enslaved people that they had actually been free for several years. Right. Right. So like there, you know, there's a lot about this kind of stuff that kids just don't get to because their teachers don't get to it, but also because um, it's, it's already not well understood. It's not, it should be studied more than it is. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I got to go back to my philosophy roots and, and just say, there's a lot of times where I just think I'm the most ignorant person about this. I know absolutely nothing. And uh, that really is the most useful perspective you can adopt um, when you're studying history. <laughs> I love uh, that. Starting I love from nothing. that. Yeah. I don't know anything about this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go learn about it. I love yes. that. I That's had to super ask healthy. about Stonehall. Yes. And, and just the fact that you're willing to say, hey, you know, uh, that's not something I've, I'm familiar with. So uh, that, is, that is so great. Uh, it's such a great tie-in. I think that we can say overall your perspective as a historian and your definition of history is that you're coming at this from the perspective of, I really don't know. So please let me learn myself or someone teach me or, or whatever that may be. So um, I think that that's yeah. super, super interesting. And I love that as like final thought when it comes to all of this is just, if you don't know, don't presume that you do, right? right. Let's Let's take some time to to learn about it and educate oneself. And maybe that might, you know, even bring you to a, a, a perspective and a place of empathy, you know, with, with your new knowledge. Exactly. I just, I couldn't have said it better myself. Well, thank you. Well, with that, I just want to say thank you for everything that you gave us. Thank you for the time and some really great quotes. You know, I'm kind of resonating on these statues are not books. I yeah, know taking nothing. Notes. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about those things and they're going to kind of linger for a while. Um, we always close the same way. So I will say like any good mom, make good choices. Yeah. And uh, assume you know nothing. Go, go learn you some stuff and happy pride, everybody. Yay. 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 Okay. Bye.
Hey friends, thanks for listening to the CKNGK podcast. Find us at CKNGK podcast on Instagram and Twitter and rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, or anywhere else that you pod. See you next time.